All right, so we're going to get started here. Uh, by way of introduction, my name's Captain Dylan Hubbard from Hubbard's Marina over in uh, Johns Pass, Madeira Beach. And we do a variety of different deep sea and near shore fishing trips on our party boats and also private charter boats. And today we wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about near shore and offshore fishing and talk with you guys about tips, tricks, regulations, techniques, whatever you guys want to hear about. Uh, we want to chat about today. So hopefully it'll be more of a fishing conversation versus a fishing seminar. I like to talk with you, not at you. So please, if you have a question, if I talk about something that you kind of want me to elaborate on, or if you have a burning question about a species or tip or trick, you can always feel free to raise your hand and uh, we'll just go question to question. Uh, I always kind of like starting out uh, to get everybody into it, uh, talking about what's going on now and kind of what we're looking forward to. Right now, this time of year, we've got our uh, hogfish bite is starting to pick up more and more. We definitely see that water temperature start cooling off. And as that water temperature cools off, with that comes more and more uh, hogfish, kind of getting more prolific around local ledges, rock piles, hard areas of flat bottom and uh, they get more and more concentrated and aggressive as that water temperature drops. Also this time of year the uh, large number of gag grouper will start moving inshore uh, with every cold front. We see more and more gag grouper move inshore. It's still early right now. Water temperatures are still pretty high but by around Thanksgiving or so that's when we really start to see that kind of kick off from Thanksgiving to New Year's Day is typically the best time to target those gag grouper as they continue to move shallower and shallower. And what happens is a lot of those female gags are the ones that move inshore uh, because they move inshore where the bait is prolific and they have a chance to get gorged up for their long journey to their spawning aggregation sites come early to middle spring of next year. So that's what those uh, female gags are doing, coming inshore and eating heavily, which makes them easier to target and more aggressive. So this time of year uh, is a special time of year for the gag grouper and hogfish. Also, we've got the kingfish and mackerel. Uh, red tide kind of threw that off a little bit. Typically, the last full moon of September or around the first full moon of October, we'll see those kingfish and mackerel start showing up on the beach for their fall run. And we actually caught a couple there towards the end of September, early October, and we were excited for that fall run of kingfish and mackerel. But unfortunately, we had that big bloom of red tide kind of bloom back up right along our beaches and it kind of pushed the bait off the beaches and with that the kingfish and mackerel. They've been hanging out a little deeper near shore but they haven't really come to the beaches like they normally would with their fall run. But now that red tide is hopefully gone from the area, we've gone about a week and a half or so with virtually no red tide in the forecast, not even background levels. So hoping, keeping our fingers crossed, knocking on wood that that trend will continue and we'll be able to have a nice kind of fall winter time frame, uh, red tide less in our area. So hopefully those kingfish and mackerel will make it back to the beaches before that water temperature dips too much and they move north out of our air or move south out of our area. Around 72 to about 78 degrees is what we're looking for to get them really thick on the beaches. But about 73 to about 75, 76 is kind of prime territory. And right now we're still a little bit above that. So hoping that we'll get some time in that sweet spot to have those kingfish and mackerel get really, really thick along our beaches. So that's kind of what we have going on now. We're looking at those gag grouper, the hogfish bites slowly picking up. Gag grouper will start soon. We're catching a few kingfish and mackerel. Deeper water, we're seeing a lot of scamp grouper and uh, tuna bite has been really good offshore. And we've been seeing wahoo too. And we've caught three sailfish in the past two weeks. So a lot of pelagic action in deeper water past 
150, 160 foot of water, that's definitely where that pelagic action is most prolific and most pronounced. But all in all, right now is a great time to get out there. It's just cold front season. So with these cold fronts, it becomes imperative to plan your trip around the fronts. What that means is you got to look at the weather and kind of essentially made it, make an educated guess on when that weather window will allow you to get out there because these cold fronts come through and typically uh, either the day it comes through or a day, day and a half previous to it coming through, that bad weather starts. Once that bad weather starts, the bite kind of shuts down near shore and even offshore and makes it difficult to get out there. And then uh, the, the bite tends to be shut off completely until that front moves past and that barometer starts ticking back up. And then deeper water past about 100, 100, 120 foot of water. As soon as that water calms down, the bite gets really good. Shallower water inside of about 100 foot of water, you have to wait for not only the water to calm down, but also clear back up. So a lot of times people are like, hey, for example, this cold front, hey, Tuesday looks decent. Wave heights only around three foot. Uh, it should be a good day out in the water, right? No, because that front just went through. The water's gonna start calming down Monday. Really, Tuesday's the first doable day to get back out on the water. The front came through there Friday night, Saturday, it's, or today, and it's really rough out there right now, seven, eight foot. So that stirs up the water quite a bit. We get this like chocolate milk sand colored water. And that's from all that, what they call turbidity mixed up in the water, or sand, essentially, uh, mixed up in the water. And then it takes time for the water to not only calm down, but clear back up. So Tuesday is the first calm day, but if you went out there offshore, past 100, 120 foot of water, the bite would be hot Tuesday. But if you stayed near shore, inside of 100 foot of water, you'd probably catch maybe some catfish, maybe a sheep's head, and not much else because the, the fish literally have sand in their gills from all that rough weather stirring up the water. And they're all tucked up in the rocks huddling up. They're a lot like us. A big hurricane's coming, what do you do? You go to your buddy's house and have a hurricane party, all hang out and get drunk, right? It's the same thing with the fish. When a big cold front's coming, those fish sense it. They go to the biggest local structure and they basically bed down and wait for that weather to pass. And then once the water clears up enough, then they venture back out and start feeding super heavily because they haven't fed for the past two, three, four days, depending on the strength of the front. So all that to say, for example, on this cold front, weather's calming down a little bit Monday, Tuesday's probably doable to get out there, but fishing won't be that good. Wednesday a little better. I would say by Thursday, the fishing should be really good. Plus, you've got another cold front coming up this weekend, uh, Saturday. So you're fishing on the back side of this front and the front side of an approaching front. So I would say the best day to go this coming week would be Thursday, based on the fact that you had a cold front Saturday and another cold front coming up Saturday. And that's not a science, that's just an educated guess because that's only one of the variables. There's a lot of other variables that go into fishing, near shore and offshore. What always cracks me up is someone's like, they'll call in when we release our, our specialty trip schedule for our 39 hour trips for the year. And they're like, well, I wanna book all the full moon trips for the whole year. What about the other moon phases? What about the new moon? What about the first quarter, last quarter? There's more to it than just moon phase or just water temperature or just currents. There's a lot that goes into it, whether it be thermocline, uh, there's pressure gradients, there's different temperature gradients, chlorophyll, there's water clarity, salinity, moon phase, bariometric pressure. There's a lot of different variables that go in to fishing. So what I always tell people when they ask, when's the best time to go fishing? When you're available. When you're available. If you're available to go fishing, go fishing. And if it's a good day of fishing, that's even better. And we always try to make it a good day of fishing, but there's certain cases like, for example, this Tuesday, where we know fishing or weather is probably gonna let us get out there, 
but it's not going to be good fishing. So there's certain days where I would say, if you're available, still want to maybe stay home. But most of the time, I would say, go ahead and go fishing. What was your question? Yeah, so if you use our website, hubbardsmarina.com, whether you fish with us or you have, you're sitting in the back and you're like, dude, I have my own boat. Whether you fish with us or you have your own boat, use our website as a tool. If you go to hubbardsmarina.com, click fishing trips, then click weather links, you can scroll down on the weather links page and there's uh, a bunch of different links that I use to check the weather myself like the NOAA buoys, the wind finder forecasts, and then there's even uh, different real-time weather buoys. And then at the very bottom of the page is kind of where I, where I spend most of my time. It's uh, Mike's weather page or spaghettimodels.com. And there's a lot of tools on that page which we kind of go more in depth on our live show on Sunday nights about. But there's what's called prog charts. And NOAA puts those out and they, they put out three uh, so for today, tomorrow, and then the next day, in big, easy to read formats, and then there's one that has like another seven days. And that, from that, if you know what you're looking at, you can see when those cold fronts are coming. And so those prog charts give you an idea of when the cold fronts are stacking up and approximately when it will be in our area. But then you have to actually watch things like the wind finder forecast, because as if you see seven days in advance that the front's coming through on a Saturday, by the time you get to that next Saturday, it could have come through Thursday, or it could be coming through Tuesday, or it could have dissipated and not even make it to our area. So forecasts are really only good about two to three days out. So what you have to do is basically check it every day or every other day to see where that front's going. Or you could just cheat and watch our videos in the morning. Uh, every day except for Wednesday, we try to do a live video to kind of update you like, hey, this is when the front's coming through. These are the best days we recommend for uh, fishing. So those morning videos are an easy cheater's way to figure out when those fronts are coming through and to monitor, monitor it a little better because I'll monitor it for you and let you know in those videos. Or you can use those tools on our website. Uh, again, hubbardsmarina.com, click uh, fishing trips and then scroll down to weather links. Now, uh, real quick before we take another question, we are giving away some free fishing trips at the end of the seminar. In order to win those free trips, you do have to have a raffle ticket. So we're going to do last call on the raffle tickets. If you had not collected one, come on up real quick, and I'll collect those up while we take the no or I'll hand you a raffle ticket while we take our next question. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, what's up, man? Flounder. Uh, so flounder is a uh, option right now around local grass flats, those little potholes, sandy patches, adjacent. Near shore. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, flounder. Uh, well, first of all, keep in mind flounder's closed uh, for a uh, spawning closure. They'll reopen December first. So right now, flounder is uh, unavailable to be harvested, but starting December first, they will reopen. Really? I got another one for you. Don't worry. Yeah, so flounder is closed until December 1st, but uh, the flounder is biting well. They are biting well around local docks. Yeah, exactly. You can catch and release flounder uh, while they're closed, but you just can't keep them. And we're seeing a lot of them. They, they are uh, bottom oriented, so they hang out right on the sandy bottom areas. And, and they're ambushing, passing crustaceans and bait fish. So look for that sandy bottom adjacent to like a bridge or a dock, and that's going to give you the best chance at catching one of those flounder. Uh, because, and even grass flats too, like if you have a grass flat, a lot of times what will happen is people are running by a grass flat and they'll hit the grass flat with their motor and that'll create a little, what we call a cut in the grass. And that's a lot of times where the flounder are hanging out too because they're waiting for that bait to roll off that grass flat so they can ambush the bait. Also keep in mind, I always jokingly say it, you gotta think like a fish. Like for example, if this sign is your grass flat and this sign is your grass flat and you've got a current going this way, then you know all those bait or all those predatory fish like flounder, the current's going this way, flounder are gonna be on the back side down current of that grass flat because they're waiting for all that bait 
to get pushed off the flat so they can ambush it. And the same thing with a snook, a redfish, a trout, they're gonna wanna be on the backside of that dock, bridge, pier, jetty, grass flat, whatever you're fishing because they wanna wait for that bait to come to them. They're very opportunistic feeders. In the summertime when the water's hot, even more so. In the wintertime when the water's cold, even more so because they don't wanna expend a lot of energy. Uh, so at, especially as water temperatures creep down, really important to make sure your bait gets to that strike zone where those fish are staged up ready to ambush that passing bait. And the least amount of energy they can expel, the better and the more likely they will to be to bite your bait. So you gotta kinda think about that and think like a fish, where is that predatory fish staging up to ambush the bait? And the same thing happens offshore. If you've got a screaming current, those fish are gonna be on the backside of that peak or ledge or wherever with their noses into the current waiting for that bait to come to them. And that's the secret to offshore fishing. Nowadays with all the technology out there like the GPS trolling motors and the crazy radars with the GPS overlay, there's not a lot of secrets left out there. And that trolling motor is all well and good. It'll keep you over a spot. But your boat being over the spot does nothing for you. Your bait has to get to the spot. And that's what a lot of people mess up on. And that's why a lot of times, just because you can get on a spot doesn't mean you're gonna catch fish. You gotta make sure your bait's catching fish. So a lot of times people will ask, oh, do you chum offshore? No, we don't typically chum in 100, 120 foot of water because if you drop chum on the surface at 120 foot of water, current grabs it and it starts hitting the bottom 100 yards away from where, away from where you're fishing and you're essentially pulling the fish away from you and making it harder for you to catch fish. So we typically wouldn't chum in that setting offshore in deep water because everybody dropping baits to the bottom is doing enough chumming. Plus, when you catch a big red grouper, gag grouper, red snapper out there in 150, 200 foot of water and you start cranking it up from the bottom, that barotrauma is gonna do the chumming for you. It pushes their stomach out of the, their mouths and it, they regurgitate everything they've eaten. So that's chumming the water for you. So the answer to do we chum is no, we catch fish. Let them chum for us. Austin, did you have a question? Uh, bait for pelagics. So uh, we're catching a lot of those blackfin tuna uh, on Rapala x rap magnums, Nomad DTX minnows, trolling between spots on those 39 hour trips, 44 hour trips. You have a shot on a 12 hour extreme trip. We don't necessarily troll on those trips, but we'll flatline for those uh, blackfin tuna. So when we're flatline fishing, typically just a dead thread fin. Uh, on a single hook, like a, a five aught circle hook, 50 pound fluorocarbon, tail hooked pinfish, or a uh, thread fin, uh, single hooked right through the eyeballs, is a great way to target those black fin tuna. Uh, we've been very successful on like the mahi colored uh, lip trolling plugs, or the redhead white body lip trolling plugs. The Wahoo, we've been seeing more on the Marauder style trolling lures, like the Shimano Bonita or the Nomad Mad Max. Those are kind of the more popular trolling. And for Wahoo, darker colors like purples, dark blues, blacks, and then kind of the hot pink accent seems to be a, a hot color as well. Good question. Any other questions, guys? Yes, sir. Great question. So he was asking about the difference between inshore, nearshore, and offshore. So every week we do a little fishing report and we email that out. You can sign up for that right on the bottom of our website at hubbardsmarina.com or at captaindillonhubbard.com. You can enter your email and you'll get that uh, fishing report emailed to you. Also, Fox 13 will upload that after our little live segment every week as well. And at the bottom of it, we have that little key and I get that question so often, I started adding that to every one of the reports because everybody's definition of inshore, nearshore, and offshore is different. So I started putting that in there. So great question, sir. Inshore to me means from around the beach to the upper bay. 
and mouths of rivers and stuff like that, creeks, lagoons, bayous. Uh, near shore to me is from the beach out to about 20 miles or about 100 foot of water. Offshore to me is beyond 100 foot of water, beyond 20 miles. So that's kind of the breakdown. Uh, so near shore fishing is primarily what 90% of people do because it's very difficult to get out there past 100 foot of water in most boats, especially with weather like we've been having. But the offshore fishing is definitely hot and that's where we're seeing a lot of that pelagic action. Good question. Any other questions? Chris. Trick to targeting mangroves. Trick to targeting mangroves, my favorite thing to talk about. So mangrove snapper are one of those species uh, that are extremely fun to target. It's, in my opinion, probably my favorite fish to target and probably one of my favorite eating fish too. Whether it's inshore, near shore, or offshore, mangrove snapper are extremely smart, very quick biting, and more leader shy. So if you can master mangrove snapper fishing, especially in deep water offshore past 100 foot of water, if you can master mangrove snapper fishing, that skill will translate to any other species and any other sort of offshore bottom fishing that you do. So mangrove snapper would be always my recommendation to focus on. And once you really get the hang of dialing in the mangrove snapper, learning how to set the hook, and you're able to catch mangrove snapper consistently and often, you're definitely approaching that expert level of offshore angling, in my opinion at least. The person who can come out and catch mangrove snapper consistently and often and catch them quickly is generally the most experienced angler because they're super smart. They're leader shy, they're, they're fast biting. So you gotta be able to feel the bite. 90% of offshore fishermen's issues are the three major things whether it's hooking your bait right to present the bait naturally, holding bottom, making sure that bait's on the bottom and it's not moving, and then uh, feeling, feeling the bite. When I say feeling the bite, a lot of people are like, hey man, I can feel the bite. I'm talking about can you lift your lead up in 150 foot of water and tell me whether or not you have bait left on the hook. That's what I mean by feeling the bite. You should be able to get to the point where you can just lift your rod tip to the sky and from the, the bounce of the lead picking up off the bottom and then the little pause and then the, the weight of your bait picking up off the bottom, you should be able to feel whether or not you have bait on the bottom. Unless you're using a little small piece of shrimp or a piece of squid, then obviously it'd be a little difficult. But if you're using a thread fin, you should be able to tell in 120, 150, 160 foot of water whether you have bait on the hook or not. And that's getting the feel for the bait and feel for the hook. And once you're able to hook the bait right, so it's presented naturally on the bottom and you're not getting tangles, you're holding bottom and you can get that feel down, you're in there. You're in there like swimwear. You're going to start catching a lot more fish when you're offshore fishing. So hooking the bait properly uh, is difficult to illustrate in Bass Pro because they, they uh, get a little angry. I tend to make messes up here. So uh, we do have videos on our YouTube channel and on our website. If you go to hubbardsmarina.com, click fishing trips and then click uh, fishing video links. There's uh, a bunch of different videos there and one is including or one of those videos includes how to rig uh, a bait with a double snell hook. And the video goes in depth on how to hook that bait. But basically, it's super important to make sure your bait is straight. Basically, when you're fishing in deeper water past 40, 50, 60 foot of water, you gotta think about hydrodynamics. And you gotta remember that as your bait goes to bottom, what's happening is your bait is gonna be pointing at your lead because your lead controls the descent of your bait to bottom. So what a lot of people will do is they're thinking about your, uh, they're thinking about their setup and their rig like it's hanging down in front of them and they make sure that the skinny part's pointing at the lead and then when you're getting down to bottom that skinny part's pointing at the lead and it's going to go to bottom quickly, it's going to go to bottom straight and it's not going to get tangled. What will happen is if you're not hooking the bait so it's straight and it causes it to, if it's off kilter at all, 
what happens is as this goes to bottom, your hooks go right up against your main line. And how often do you drop down to bottom, wait for a little while, you don't get a bite, you reel up and you've got a tangled mess. That's because you didn't hook your bait right. Your bait spun on the way to bottom and it caused that spinning bait caused your main line to get tangled with your uh, leader and all of a sudden you're sitting on the bottom with a tangled mess and that fish isn't going to get anywhere close to it unless it's super aggressive and it just is ready to eat. But nine out of ten times a smart mangrove snapper isn't going to get anywhere close to your uh, leader and your bait if it's tangled up. So you really got to take a lot of care to learn how to hook that bait properly so it doesn't spin and it's nice and straight. The double snell rig is definitely the trick when you're out there fishing for those mangrove snapper because you want to make sure that you have two hooks in that bait so that way you're getting more opportunities to get the hook in that fish's mouth. Because those mangrove snapper, what they do is they come up and they'll crush the bait and pop the bait and then they'll, come, they'll do a quick circle and they'll come around and clean up the mess. So a lot of times when you feel a mangrove snapper bite, it's kind of like pop, 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 and that's what he's doing. He comes up and snaps the bait and then he cleans up his mess real quick. So he'll crush it to kill it and then he'll eat it. So with a uh, thread fin, that first initial pop, a lot of times will break up that bait. And with that double snell rig, it breaks up the bait but you still got a hook in each piece of the bait that broke up. So your chances of hooking up are exponentially increased with that double snell rig. So the double snell rig is really mandatory if you're targeting mangrove snapper near shore or offshore. Now inshore, I would stick to a single hook rig because they're more leader shy. So from the Skyway, the Skyway channel, 20, 30, 40 foot of water, single hook rig. Outside of that double snell, and from 40 to about 100 foot of water, four to five aught hook, beyond 100 foot of water, five, six aught hook. Once you get past 150, six aught hook uh, for those mangrove snapper. And the trick with mangrove snapper also is you got to think about what kind of hook you're using. Don't use, uh, a lot of people, hey, I, I can't catch those mangroves, man, I'm really struggling. And I look at their hooks and they're using the 4X double strong hooks with, that are the hook shank is the width of my pinky. You're never going to hook up a mangrove snapper that's quick biting with that super thick extra strong hook. You want a super thin wire hook. The thinner the wire, the easier it is that hook's going to drive itself home. Also, thinner barbs. Some of these hooks they make like live bait hooks have extremely large barbs on them to hold your live bait on the hook but it makes it very difficult for that hook to drive itself home because it has to push harder to get inside that fish's mouth. So thinner wire hooks, thinner barb hooks, and uh, that's going to be your ticket to mangrove snapper. Then holding bottom. So holding bottom becomes super important uh, because you want to make sure you're dancing with the boat. Now a lot of times uh, I talk about this, but people don't really understand what I mean by that. So sir, I'm going to use you as an example. You're just going to put your arm out like this, palm flat up, yep, and you're going to dance, you're going to be uh, the, the moving boat. So you're just going to move your arm real slowly like the boat's bouncing. So I'm able to sit there and without looking, just from the feel of the weight, I'm a keep moving man, just like the boat. So, uh, so I'm able to look away and just by the feel of the weight, I'm able to keep that weight or the line tight enough to feel the weight, but not tight enough to, uh-oh, don't drop it now, tight enough to feel the weight, but not tight enough to disturb the weight in his hand. So as he moves up and down, you can see the weight standing or sitting still. It's not being disturbed on the bottom. And my rod tip is always moving. Even if it's flat calm, you're good, man. I know you're getting tired. Uh, I'm, I got even, a shot yeah. Even, even in flat, calm conditions, the boat's always moving a little bit. So I'll go by down the deck and someone's like looking, hey man, Cap, we got to move. The, the, there's no fish here. And he's drinking a beer, holding his rod tip like this. I'm like, okay, bud. Uh, because I know he's not on the bottom. He's not feeling the bite. You got to constantly be actively fishing. The guy sitting there going like this on the side of the boat, that's who I know is actively fishing. If they're not getting bites, yeah, all right, we can move. 
because that's the person who's gonna feel the bite. You gotta keep the line tight enough to feel the lead, but not disturb the lead on the bottom. Keep in mind the bottom we're fishing is hard bottom. You're targeting on your own boats hard bottom. Hard bottom areas have a layer of silt or sand. That big old six ounce lead dropping to bottom creates a big old puff of sand on the bottom. And what'll happen is if that six ounce lead is being disturbed on the bottom with every wave, it's creating puffs of sand. And that fish is never gonna get anywhere close to your lead if you're letting that lead move on the bottom at all. Keep in mind, sound travels three times faster uh, in the water than it does over land. And I'm just gonna move my rod tip about two feet. Sometimes it's four or five foot seas out there. So I'm just gonna move my rod tip about two feet. It's pretty loud, right? So imagine if your lead's doing this nonstop and puffs of sand are being created. Think you're gonna catch any fish? Heck no. And that's what people are literally out there doing when you're holding your rod tip steady. You gotta dance with the boat. You gotta constantly be moving with the boat. If the boat's going down, my rod tip's going up. If the boat's going down, my rod, you gotta constantly dance. Keep that line tight enough to feel the lead, but not tight enough to disturb that lead on the bottom. That's the trick. The other trick is, so we, uh-oh, I'm getting tangled up. So, so we talked about hooking the bait so it goes to bottom straight and doesn't get tangled up. The other part of presenting your bait naturally is making sure your leader's nice and stretched out. So what a lot of times, I'm gonna use this glass table, hopefully we don't break it. So uh, let me straighten up this leader here real quick. Bouncing my lead up and down, got me a nice tangle already. So what'll happen a lot of times when you're dropping your leader down to bottom is as the bait goes down to bottom, the leader goes down to bottom, nine out of 10 times your lead and your hook are gonna drop pretty close together. So the whole reason you're using a leader is to make sure that that leader is stretched out and your bait is further from the uh, weight because inevitably you're gonna mess up and that lead might move a little bit and create a little puff of sand. So the further your hook is from your lead, the more natural it's gonna appear and the greater the chance of that smart mangrove snapper or gag grouper of biting your bait. So you wanna make sure your leader is nice and stretched out. So whenever you drop to bottom, whenever I drop to bottom, I'll drop to bottom, my line stops going out, I put my reel in gear, and then I'll wait a second, typically about a minute. If I don't get a bite right away, then I'll slowly lift my rod tip up to the sky and then I'll slowly drop my uh, weight back down. And what happens is the, the natural current that is down there, the swing of the boat, whether it's the swing of the boat, the current under, uh, at the bottom of the uh, Gulf of Mexico, or whatever it might be, the wind pushing you on your drift, it's gonna straighten out your leader just naturally when you slowly lift your rod tip up and slowly lower it back down to bottom. And then now, instead of your bait being right next to your weight, now your bait's all the way out here. And it looks a lot more natural on the bottom and you're getting the full use out of the leader. If you're constantly dropping down and not straightening out your leader, you might as well be fishing with a six inch leader. If you're putting a four or five foot leader on it, you gotta stretch out that leader to make sure that bait is pre uh, being presented as naturally as possible. So you've hooked your bait right, it didn't spin on the way down, you got to bottom, you're actively fishing, and then you straightened out your leader. Now you're ready. Now the last part of it is making sure you're ready to set the hook. So for mangrove snapper, using a higher gear ratio reel is important because the higher the gear ratio, the quicker the retrieve and the more quickness you have in hooking that fish. The lower gear ratio means more power, more torque, but a slower retrieve. So that's why these new two-speed reels are so fancy because it's like having two reels in one because you have the option of going from high gear to low gear and from low gear to high gear.
Just like in your truck or your vehicle, if you're in fifth gear, you can go a lot faster than first gear, but first gear is gonna have the power and the torque. So it's the same idea with your reels. So a lot of times when you come out and someone's using a, uh, whatever reel you might be using, but it's like a four to one or five to one gear ratio reel, and they're dropping down live pinfish for a gag grouper with 80 pound leader, it's like, sure you wanna do that? You might wanna grab a rental rod or get a bigger rod and reel because that higher gear ratio, if you do hook that grouper, you have very little chance of actually landing that fish successfully because with that higher gear ratio, you're not gonna have the torque and the power to get that fish up off the bottom. That's what drives me crazy about spinning reels. Spinning reels, yeah, they make these super fancy spinning reels now that are awesome, don't get me wrong, I got one, but they, they don't have the power because A, they're not made, is there a spinning reel over there? No, those are all fly rods. I, I, I'll demonstrate it without grabbing one, but basically they're not made to fish the same way a conventional rod is made to fish. You don't have the same physical ability. So you could have a spinning reel and a conventional reel of the same quality, power, drag, gear ratio, and all day, every day, I'm gonna pick the conventional reel versus the spinning reel when I'm bottom fishing. Because what's happening is when you're bottom fishing, the proper way to hold a bottom fishing conventional rod is the, whether you're right-handed or left-handed. Whether you're right-handed or left-handed, the butt of the rod is underneath your right arm, your right hand's on the reel, and your left hand is in front of the reel. And what, what that creates is that creates this triangle with your left arm. When you get a big fish on, your elbow goes in front of your body, and now I'm not using my arms to lift that fish. I'm not fighting that fish with my arms at all. I'm fighting that fish with my 290 pound frame. All I have to do is lean back and that elbow being in my gut is what's lifting that fish. And if it's a really big fish, I'll drop down to a knee and my, my rod has an extra long foregrip so I have more foam on the front of the rod and I'll put it right on the rail and drop down to a knee and use the rail if I have to, to lift that fish up and then gain some line on that grouper that's digging me to the rocks. With the spinning reel, you're, you're holding it like this and you're fighting that fish with one bicep. So you could have the nicest spinning reel in the world with the most drag power ever, but you physically cannot fight that fish with one arm better than you can fight that fish with your whole body. And with the spinning reel, if you want to try to drop it to the rail, guess what happens? Your line's rubbing on the rail. That's not good. So a spinning reel does not work for bottom fishing for that reason. And also higher gear ratio reels don't work for that reason because the higher the gear ratio, the lower the torque or the, yeah, the lower the torque and the less power you have. So you want to pay attention to the gear ratio reels. That's why some people will be like, why does that guy have four rods for today's trip? Because they're using different rods for different species of fish they're targeting. Me personally, I might take on a 10 hour trip, I might take two rods. On a 39 hour, I might take three, four, maybe five rods, but there's really no need for more than that. Uh, some people go really overboard, but really you just need a few rods. One, for example, on a 39 hour trip, we're fishing 120 to 250 foot of water, 70 to 100 miles out. I'd be bringing about three or four rods, maybe one to troll with. So I'd have my trolling rod. I'd have a flat line rod in case I see a tuna, wahoo, mahi, mahi swim by. And then I'd have a knocker rigging rod, which probably my knocker rigging rod and my pitch rod would be the same spinning reel. Then I'd have one conventional setup with a two-speed reel in the 40, 50 pound class, so that's three rods. And then I'd have another one in the 60 to 80 pound class, that's four rods. And then I'd have the big boy over here with a 100 pound main line and a 125 pound leader for the big, big fish if I'm dropping down a big live bait. So that's, that would be the four or five rods if I decide to troll or not. On a 10 hour trip, it would just be that 40, 50 pound class 
conventional reel, and then maybe a 20, 30 pound mainline spinning reel, like a 4,000 series spinning reel. And that inshore, inside a hundred foot of water, a spinning reel with live shrimp or a small piece of shrimp or a small piece of squid would be a preferred or recommended bottom fishing setup uh, inside a hundred foot of water near shore. Once you go offshore, lose the spinning reel for bottom fishing, unless you're knocker rigging or you're using it for a pitch rod or you're fishing on a boat with four or five other guys and you just want to have some fun, then light tackle fishing becomes uh, more common. But if you're in a party boat setting with 20, 30, 40, 50 people around you, don't be that guy who brings a spinning reel to hook up with an amberjack because you're going to tangle everybody around you and you're going to lose your fish. Everybody's going to be pissed in that situation. So you want to make sure you use the right tool for the job. Real important. Did that answer your mangrove snapper question? <laughs> yes. So historically, five years ago, I would have said no. Mangrove snapper fishing is a summer or a spring and summer thing. Recently, over the last five years, mangrove snapper fishing's really changed in our area. And uh, I, don't, I don't really necessarily know why, but we've seen a big trend change. And exactly what you said is not quite what you said, but he asked it, do bigger mangrove snapper come closer in in the wintertime? What we've noticed is bigger mangrove snapper are caught more consistently in cooler weather. So typically, historically, like I said, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, we catch some mangroves, but we wouldn't catch a lot of them. And they would be average size. Now it's like in those cooler months, we're catching a lot of mangroves still, and the average size is very large. So some of the time our biggest mangrove snapper are caught in those cooler months. And a lot of times, even out deep, we're seeing a lot of those mangrove snapper. I don't think they come in as much as the inshore population the life cycle of a mangrove snapper, they start out in the Gulf as phytoplankton, they move inshore into the estuaries once they get to be, I don't know, a centimeter long, and then they grow up until they're about 10 inches or so, 10 to 12 inches, and then they move near shore. So at 10 inches, 50% of the population is sexually reproductive. At 12 inches, 75%. So that's when those fish generally will move offshore or near shore to spawn. So the bigger the mangrove snapper, typically the more likely they will be to move near shore and offshore to spawn. And they typically do that in the cooler months, one of the last full moons of late summer, early fall. So this time of year, it's when those bigger mangrove snapper are leaving Tampa Bay and cruising out to those near shore waters to eventually make it offshore. So this is the time of year where we pick up a lot of those random 18, 20, 24 inch mangrove snapper in way shallower water than they should be because they're all leaving the estuary of Tampa Bay and migrating to offshore waters to spawn. So this is the time of year where we see a lot of those big random mangrove snapper on like say a 10 hour trip or even a half day trip, we see some large mangrove snapper this time of year. It's not anything where we're like, oh, we're catching a ton of mangroves, but you'll see some nice mangrove snapper. And on a 10 hour trip, if you go out there and you fish that double snell rig with like 30 pound fluorocarbon, double snell four aughts with cut thread fins like you do on a 39 hour trip, you can limit out on mangroves on a 10 hour trip. It's just no one does that. Everybody's fishing with shrimp for hogfish. Uh, but if you start targeting those mangrove snapper, you will catch them on those 10 hour trips, especially this time of year. So there's definitely an opportunity for it, for sure. You mentioned the charters. Do you have um, specific um, teaching charters where you go out and target a certain fish and teach about how, how to catch that fish? Yeah. So he was asking about char private charters. Could you privately charter a boat where you say, hey, I want to go catch this fish, and then we go out there and teach you more about it and how to target it yourself. And we do that quite often. It's all, and everybody does that to an extent in the area. You just got to be upfront. So if you have your own boat and you want to learn more about how to fish near shore or offshore, you just got to, I, I, one of the best ways to learn is go out and do it with the charter captain, book a private charter, and when you're booking it, be like, hey man, 
I want to be up front with you. I got my own boat. I'm trying to learn how to do this. I just moved down here, uh, or I just bought this boat. I've always wanted to learn. They are more than happy to tell you, but tell them that up front. Don't let them find out halfway through the trip that you just bought a boat and you're learning how to fish, because that, that can get ugly. But tell them up front, and they'll be more than happy to work through that with you and, and teach you how uh, to operate the vessel, talk to you more about maneuvering the boat, getting on the fish, all that good stuff. We do that quite often. And there's resources now in this day and age of technology out there, like YouTube is obviously a big one, but like say Salt Strong. Salt Strong comes out with us. I think we filmed four courses now where we spend like three or four days on the boat and they go through everything and they film everything and they turn it into digestible little three, four minute clips. Like literally they spent four days on a boat with me, filmed hours, I think we were like 10, 12 hours every day. So they had 40 hours of footage and they turned it into like a three and a half hour course of all these small, easy to digest three or four minute videos. So there's a lot of different tools out there that you guys can utilize, like say saltstrong.com, uh, one of their courses to get up your knowledge level quickly or use YouTube or like our live show we do every Sunday night. You can tune in on YouTube or Facebook and we do a seminar just like this, so, except for it's over the computer. And we upload all that stuff to our website. So literally we have four years worth of live shows on the website and on our YouTube channel. All our Bass Pro Shop seminars are recorded and we put that up there too. So there's a lot of information out there at your fingertips, up, up to you to digest or not. And then always a private charter option because there's no substitute for obviously the one-on-one -on -one in person training that you would get on a private charter. Now on a private charter you'd have to use their boat or can you use yours? So uh, his question was on a private charter, do you have to use the charter captain's boat or do you have to use your own? So you? so yeah, can you? So like say you went out and bought one of those beautiful Makos out front here at Bass Pro Shops and you got it home and you're like, uh oh, how do I do this? <laughs> uh, you can hire a captain to come out and operate the boat for you, show you more about your boat, how to work the electronics, all that good stuff. That's called a consult, a consult trip or a consulting trip. There's a lot of captains in the area that do that. We don't do it super often ourselves at Hubbard's Marina, uh, but we do, and some of our captains will, especially this time of year when we're a little bit slower, uh, we can schedule that out for you and get you with a captain. Or come out on the party boat and pick up those little pieces over time, picking the captain's brain. It basically depends on your budget. If you want to throw two, three, four grand at the problem, a consult trip works great. If you want to throw one, two, three grand at the problem, a couple private charters work great. If you want to do it for four or five hundred bucks, use YouTube, Salt Strong, and go on a couple party boat trips and pick the captain's brain on the way out and way back. Those are your basic options to get your uh, experience level up operating your own vessel. Yeah, so brining your bait was his question on the different trips. So I would brine your bait if you're on a super long trip uh, that you're going to be fishing more than 10, 12 hours. So brining bait becomes one of those things that's talked about in our live show and it's talked about on the dock and we have some videos about it. And people will come out on like say a 10 hour trip and start talking about brine and bait. You don't really have to brine bait on a 10 hour trip because you're, you don't have that much fishing time. Brining bait, the reason you brine the bait is because you want that bait to have a tougher exterior and a more mushy, juicy interior, and you want it to last over the course of a long period of time. So if you were going out fishing on a 39 hour trip, we set boxes of bait out there by the fish box on the ride out. And you go back there to the fish box, you open that box of bait, and you can prepare your, bri your brine cooler or bait cooler. And a lot of times it's solid frozen bait. So then you just break some off and you cut them up. Cut the head, cut the tail, trim the belly, put a layer in, maybe a little bit of ice, heavy salt. And then just a layer of bait, heavy salt, layer of bait, heavy salt. And then I'll even put a scoop or two of salt water on top of it when I'm done. So that way I have a cooler full of 
a, a couple ice cubes, and then a lot of frozen bait and a ton of salt and a little bit of salt water, and I'll stick it up underneath the bench by my fishing spot. And then when, when we start fishing on that 39 hours, seven, eight, nine hours later, the bait's starting to thaw out, and I've got this kind of pinkish looking water that's super salty. It works well through the night, but you're essentially just using frozen bait. Really, it doesn't start becoming effective until about 10, 11 o'clock the next day. Then about midday that next day, you open that cooler and you're like, oh, that looks disgusting. It's like a dark purplish brown liquid at that point. The bait's totally thawed out. Holy moly. I got a lot louder since the last time I was here. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Beat me to my joke. <laughs> uh, so uh, what I was saying is by about midday, that, that liquid is purplish brown and your bait's totally thawed out and the skin of that thread fin is nice and tough and the interior of that bait is almost liquefied with this crazy, crazy oily smell. And you hook that bait up and you start dropping it to bottom and you can literally see once that bait starts going down five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 feet, you'll see plumes of oil coming up to the surface. That's awesome. That's all the smells being emitted from that bait and that oil slick. Once it gets down there to the bottom is just ringing the dinner bell. So that's why you would brine your bait. But also that takes 10, 12, 14, almost 20 hours to really get right. So on a 10 hour trip, if you were to brine your bait out on the way out, not until you got home that night would it really be effective. So if you're gonna brine your bait for a day trip, you really need to go out and get your own bait the night before and prepare that at home and then bring your bait cooler with you already ready to rock and roll. So not everybody does that, that's a lot of work. And I know if I brought a box of bait home, my wife would murder me. So, <laughs> as will uh, Chris Peterson's, apparently. So, <laughs> so you got to be careful with that. Uh, I always recommend sticking to the brining on those longer trips uh, for that reason. You really don't need it on a day trip because the frozen bait works well. But the brine bait doesn't come off the hook as easily and has a lot of smell to it. So it does work very well. but. It, it takes a lot of effort and kind of uh, legwork to get that bait brined well, to answer your question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so he's asking about trolling on the long range trip. So on any of our trips, five hours, 39 hours, 44 hours, we allow trolling. Typically the 10 and 12 hour trips are moving too fast to troll, but we're going bottom fishing. So on the party boat trips, there's 20, 30, 40 people that want to go bottom fishing. So the guy trolling out back, if he hooks a fish, we're not going to stop the boat so he can retrieve that fish when there's 39 other people who want to go fishing. So the boat continues to move. So you really need a super big reel to retrieve that fish while the boat's moving. So really probably a 50 wide, two speed, 80 wide, two speed is about as small as you want to go. 50 wide. A 30 wide two speed is a little too small. On a half day trip, a five hour trip, you could get away with that. Uh, like I know some people will, will bring their Saltiga LD50s, which is basically like a 30 wide two speed. Uh, and they'll use that for trolling on a five hour. But on a 39 hour trip, that wouldn't really work. Because if you hook a big uh, kingfish, 10, 12, 14 pound kingfish, takes a lot of power to get that fish in while the boat's moving seven, eight, nine knots. That's about how fast we cruise on those five, 39 and 44 hour trips. So you really need a big beefy reel to troll while the boat's moving. Good question though. Any other questions? What? Type of sinkers. So yeah, we uh, definitely uh, recommend. Now I don't see it as much. It used to be really common back in the day, but I don't see it as much now. It seems like almost everywhere has these egg sinkers, but 
always want to opt for the slip lead. This is called a fish finder rig. So we put an egg sinker on our main line. And then from the main line, we put in a barrel swivel. And then from the barrel swivel, we have a, a typically about a three to five foot leader and then your uh, hooks. And that's a fish finder rig, but it's very important to have that slip lead instead of uh, the old school swivel lead. They used to have a swivel on either side of the lead, which I don't really see those too often anymore. And the reason we don't use those anymore is because the fish has to bite this bait hard enough to pick this six ounce lead off the bottom before you feel the bite with that swivel on either side of the lead. With this slip lead, the very slightest tap to that bait is allowing that line to pull through the lead and you'll be able to feel it. So just tapping my finger on the lead, you can see my rod tips moving. Whereas if I was using one of those leads with a swivel, I mean, I can tap that line all I want, even if I pull it tight, I can tap that line all I want and that rod tip's not really bouncing. Whereas if I loosen that up and pull it tight and just touch the line just a little bit, that rod tip's bouncing. So that's really important to keep that slip lead for that reason. And the knocker, or uh, this fish finder rig is really the most uh, efficient way to present that bait most naturally. What a lot of people will do is they'll, I'll see them come out and they'll use a knocker rig style. And a knocker rig is simply just removing the swivel from this tackle setup. And you're allowing that egg sinker to go all the way down to your hook. A knocker rig works really well if you're using a knocker rig. If you're using a heavy lead, you're not using a knocker rig. You just didn't put a swivel in your uh, fish finder rig. A knocker rig setup is meant to fish the water column and is meant to fish that larger area and drift fish and target things like hogfish or mangrove snapper. And you're fishing on the way to bottom because that knocker rig, that bait pulls away from that lead as it goes down to bottom. And the further it pulls away from that lead, the slower it descends. If you fish a knocker rig, you cast it out there and you don't put any pressure on the line, a lot of times your lead will hit bottom. And then you go to reel up the slack and you have to reel for a second. That's because your bait pulled away from that lead and it descended more slowly to bottom. And that's what makes a knocker rig a knocker rig is you're giving that bait a slower descent to bottom and an opportunity for that fish up in the water column to hit the bait. So a knocker rig by definition is fishing the water column so you're using a lighter weight. If you're using more than a one ounce lead, you're not really knocker rigging. You're just basically dropping the bottom with a little bit more of a uh, com compact rig. And on our 10 hour trip, a lot of times people will knock a rig with a one, one and a half, two ounce lead. And the reason we do that is for hogfish with a live shrimp because those hogfish are visually cruising above the water looking for those puffs of sand because they're looking for crustaceans. So you'll cast out away from the boat and a lot of times you'll bounce that lead to you slowly and that's attracting those hogfish. Those puffs of sand are good when you're targeting hogfish. When you're targeting anything else, it's not good. So there's, there's some differences to the hogfish method. Um, and there's a video again on our website that talks more about hogfish techniques. Uh, there's I think two of them now uh, that talks about hogfish techniques and tackle uh, choices for it that is worth watching. But definitely nine out of 10 times using a fish finder setup with a four to six ounce lead. The lead size becomes important, especially once you start getting deeper and you start getting more current. The deeper you go, the heavier lead you want to use, and the more current you have, the heavier lead you want to use. But a general rule of thumb is you take your main line and you drop the zero, and that's your size lead. So if you're fishing 80 pound test main line, you'd want an eight ounce sinker. If you're fishing a 100 pound test main line, you'd want a 10 ounce sinker. If you're fishing 40 pound main line, you'd want a four ounce sinker, exactly. So that's typically the general rule of thumb. Now, once you get deeper and you get more current going, it becomes super important for everybody to use the same size main line and the same size lead. 
Once you're fishing 200 foot of water and there's a decent current, if you got one guy using 60 pound, uh, another 10 guys using 80 pound, and one guy's using 30 pound, and the 30 pound guy's using four ounce lead, and the 80 pound guy's using 10 ounce lead, and the 80 pound guys are using six ounce leads, you're gonna have a huge tangled mess. But if everybody's using 60 pound with eight ounce sinkers, we can fish even in very strong currents because everybody's, as long as everybody's working together and they're dropping at the same time. Like if you go down on one of those specialty trips and you're fishing a thousand foot, 1500 foot, 2000 foot of water with those electric reels and five pound bank sinkers, literally the captain and crew will tell you not to drop the lines in until they're ready. And when they tell you, everybody drops together. And if you missed it, you can't drop. You're not allowed to fish until everybody retrieves their lines and then they'll tell everybody, all right, drop them in again. And then everybody drops them in together. Because if you're two minutes behind and you go to drop down behind those people, your line is gonna drift into theirs and everybody's gonna get tangled. Whereas if you're all using the same size main lines, same size leads, you can fish in extremely deep water as long as you're all working together. Meaning if there's five of us down the side and all five of us are dropping down and we notice our lines are going out this way, or excuse me, if we notice our lines are going back this way, let me illustrate it on my, this is my boat. So the five of us are sitting on this side of the boat. We all cast out or drop straight down and our lines are all going back down the side of the boat. If those five anglers are working together, I reel up in the middle because I want to check my bait or I caught a fish. I reel up. I don't drop straight back down because this guy on the, in front of me has his line going right in front of me. So what I would do is I would shift in front of him or I would dip my rod tip and cast way up here against the current. So that way the time my line hits the bottom, I'm straight in front of me and I know my line's on the outside of him. So if I catch a fish, I can't land that fish until I bring my rod to the other side of him or I fish my rod underneath his because that's teamwork, working together, making sure we're not getting tangled up. And that's what's so important on party boat trips that we all work together as a team and we're all using the same size line, same size weights. And if you know that example just occurred, you gotta make sure that you're working with the people around you to land fish successfully. That's why I always harp on the fact that there's not one spot better on anywhere, on any trip, ever, on any boat. The best spot to fish is where the other advanced anglers are. <laughs> because then you can work together with those other advanced anglers, you're not getting tangled, and you're gonna catch more fish. Because when Sally over here catches a fish, it regurgitates all the bait it was eating, and now it's creating a little chum slick, and then I'll catch a fish fishing next to Sally, and then John over here catches a fish, and now the bite's on in this little area. And we can all work together to make sure that we're not getting tangled, and we're gonna keep catching fish after fish. All of a sudden, everybody on the boat's like, the captain put those guys on the spot, not us. No, it's just they're working together. They know what they're doing. They're actively fishing. They're hooking their bait straight. They're stretching out that leader. They're doing all those little things that are adding up to success. And that's what it comes down to, is just putting the pieces of the puzzle together and working with the people around you to be as successful as possible. And stay positive. Keep your ears open. Ask questions and uh, enjoy your time on the water. That's the trick. All right, we got time for one more question. Anything, anybody? <laughs> no, not me. Anything else, guys? What? Shut the night snappers down? The 12 hour night snapper? Typically because that night snapper, uh, we offer a 12 hour night snapper trip around the moon phases. And around spring to early fall, we offer them between two to four times a month. Again, based on the moon phases. And then in the cooler months, historically we just never operated them, ever. Now in the last year or two, I've been slowly adding them in to where we have one maybe two a month on those slower, 
cooler months because generally and historically when it's cool out, we don't catch a lot of mangroves. But as I said earlier, it's been changing. So I've slowly been adding 12 hour night snappers outside of uh, spring and summer and slowly been growing it. Last year we offered like January, February, March, April, and then we did a couple in, in September, October this year. Next year we'll have one, one every month on the full moon and then spring and fall or spring and summer we'll have three or four a month. So next year we'll have one every month. But w to answer your question, we just historically haven't caught a lot of mangroves in cooler months, so we just don't offer them in cooler months for that reason. But uh, last year we offered them more um, in the first part of the year when we had that deep water closure and everybody's focused on mangroves and we caught a lot of them. So we're going to do it again next year. So our schedule is very uh, worked out in some areas just because we've been doing it so, for so many years, it works. But in other areas like that 12 hour night snapper, we're, we're still playing around with it and learning as we go. And uh, we've seen success with the trip. A lot of people like it. We catch a lot of fish, so we're going to offer it more. And hopefully our lane snapper problem will be worked out next year. Any other questions? All right, guys, we are just about out of time here for the seminar. Now, keep in mind, y'all, uh, we are still going to do that trip giveaway. If you were here for the first 15 minutes or so of the seminar, you got a raffle ticket. You got an option to win those free trips. If you were after that point, guys, unfortunately, we got to keep it fair. And uh, only those people who arrived in the first 15 minutes got tickets. Uh, but everybody, hopefully, uh, you'll have a chance to join us on our Sunday night live stream shows. We do them every Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. on our Hubbard's Marina Facebook and YouTube channel. Uh, also, we have all those videos on our website I was telling you about. We've got uh, our YouTube channel. If you look up Hubbard's Marina, subscribe to our channel. We've been doing some videos more and more and more, and we got some cool stuff coming up that are going to bring you even more videos. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. And then our Bass Pro Shops uh, seminars, hopefully, will be back on every month. Uh, so we'll be announcing those as well. At CaptainDylanHubbard.com, you can click Upcoming Events, and that's our calendar of events. So anything that I'm doing, fishing show, radio show, TV show, Bass Pro Shops seminars, it's all right there at CaptainDylanHubbard.com and the events page. So check that stuff out. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, all that good stuff. And uh, hopefully we'll see you out in the water uh, to go fishing. What if you're too busy? Yeah, and don't forget, if you're too busy to go fishing, you're just too busy. Yes, sir, do you have an announcement? Big round of applause.